Hi, I'm Kayla Goldstein, and I work for Thrive Agency's organic social media marketing team. And I'm Emily Bauer, and I work on the paid social team at Thrive. And we're here to talk to you today about social media marketing for legal professionals. So what we're going to go over in this presentation is first and foremost, whether or not you need social media as a legal professional, then we'll overview the different social media marketing platforms and how you can best use those to your advantage, how to find your niche on social media, how to conduct competitor research, organic social media marketing strategies, as well as paid social media marketing and advertising strategies. And then last but not least, how to measure social advertising success. So to start things off, do you need social media? We wouldn't be here if the answer was no. So of course the answer is yes. In this modern age, social media has become more and more important for advertising, regardless of the type of industry you're in. And legal professionals are no exception. Um, in fact, a survey by attorney at work found that 96% of respondents use social media for their law firms or legal practices. So I know some of you might be thinking, well, my audience isn't on social media. Well, I don't have to be on it. But the truth is, no matter who is in your audience, they are somewhere on social media. You just have to find them. So some people might prefer certain platforms over others or certain types of wording over others, but they're out there and you can use social media to reach them. Um, if nothing else, social media can serve as an extension of your website and another place for people to be able to contact you and have these conversations in a way that they might not have been able to do 20 or 30 years ago. So here's an overview of some of the most popular social media platforms that you should know about. Facebook tends to have the largest user base out of any of these platforms, and it does tend to skew a little bit older in terms of who is on there. So if your audience consists mostly of older people in that sort of generation or older millennials, this is the platform for you. Facebook does also own Instagram, so there's a lot of capabilities to go back and forth between these two platforms, and it has the most robust paid advertising platform of all of these. So you can actually use a shared budget with between Facebook and Instagram. So it's really useful to be able to be on both of those. Instagram, on the other hand, is a lot more visual. So any single post on Instagram has to have an image to go along with it. So that's an important thing to consider. Um, and the audience does tend to be a little bit younger with two thirds of users below the age of 35. LinkedIn, on the other hand, is more of a professional user base, so a lot of people actually use LinkedIn to find new jobs. So that's going to be the most important platform for you if you're looking to recruit new uh, lawyers, attorneys, paralegals, anyone to your firm or to your business. That's going to be the platform for you. But it can also be a great tool to find professionals in your niche and have them uh, more in tune with your brand and what you're all about and to send more traffic back to your website. Twitter is also an important one, not to forget. Um, 69 million active users are in the US, so it's still a big driving force around social media with 57% of users between the ages of 25 and 49. So definitely big with that millennial audience as well. So in order to stand out on social media, you have to find some sort of niche. And what I mean by that is kind of twofold. So on one hand, it's, you know, what is your legal specialty? Do you do family law? Do you do personal injury law? How do you find people who need the services that you provide? On the other hand, you have your brand voice. So are you humorous? Are you sharing memes? Are you sharing funny, short little videos and things that people want to share? Or are you posting more informative blog articles and long form things that people can read to really learn about this industry? So what you share really depends on, first of all, what other types of advertising you've done in the past. So you want your social media to complement these other forms of advertising. If you have a lot of billboards or pamphlets, uh, if people kind of know you around town and you already have this brand voice, you want to keep that consistent online so people know, you know, this is that same company that I know and trust. Um, but if you're really starting from scratch, a good resource is competitor research. So seeing what other law firms or people in your field are doing, as well as seeing what your target audience is sharing, what they're looking at, what accounts they follow. 
to see what you can do to inform your social media marketing strategy. So once you've found your brand voice and your niche on social media, the next trick is to make sure that your branding is consistent across the board. So this can be done through very careful copywriting, consistent imagery, and regular types of features. So what you're going to want to do is create brand guidelines if you don't already have them. Uh, this can best be done through a PDF that's usually easily shared between different people across your company or anyone else you're working with if you are to hire an agency or a marketing professional to help out with your marketing, especially on the digital space. Having guidelines for what types of colors you use, what types of images you use, just really helps to keep your branding consistent across the board and have this professional online persona. So you might be asking what these brand guidelines should include. So one of the most important things is keeping a consistent color scheme. So it's helpful to have the actual hex codes for those colors. So anyone who's a graphic designer across the board can help out with creating images that have these very consistent colors. I would suggest sticking to two to five colors. Uh, fonts, I would suggest having about two. So having title font you like to use and a subtitle font that goes below that, just to make sure that all of your branding is the same across the board. Uh, you might have a style guide. So if you have certain ways people have to use your logo, if you don't like the color being changed or you don't like it in a certain shape, or maybe you have more than one logo people can use, making sure people know how to use those correctly as well as the types of imagery you like to have. So if you have a lot of great photos from within your office you wanna use, or if you have no photos and you want to use cartoon vector art, or you wanna use stock photos, make sure that people know this and just keep it very consistent across the board so people always know what to expect when they're seeing a branded post from your company. So there are a couple of free tools that can help you out when it comes to building out these guidelines. So Canva is a great resource for creating uh, templates for images. You can make infographics on it. You can do all sorts of really great graphic design through Canva. They also have a lot of stock photos as well. Uh, there is a paid version that will give you access to a lot more of these features uh, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, there's a color dropper extension for Google Chrome that's really helpful for finding those color hex codes. So if let's say you built out your website a while ago, you have no idea what those color codes are besides blue or green, you can use this extension to find the exact hex code of that specific color so you can repurpose that for all of your visual media. And then uh, if you don't want to spring for full on Photoshop, there is a free resource called Photopea that is essentially a lower quality version of Photoshop. So if you need to edit images or have graphic designers using that, that's another resource out there for you as well. So earlier in this presentation, I mentioned competitor research as a great tool to inform your strategy. So a very important part of social media marketing is consistently staying one step ahead of your competition. And this might not necessarily be a direct competitor, this could even just be another law firm or another company that's even outside of the legal space where you really admire what they're doing online and on social media. So you can just consistently be keeping track of these brands. Um, it's actually called social listening. It's when you're looking at what they're doing, who's engaging with them, how are people interacting, and using that knowledge to inform your own strategy. So we don't recommend directly copying anything, of course, but making sure that you're staying a step ahead. If there's a certain thing they're doing that you might be able to take advantage of as well, go for it. Or if there's something they're doing that people don't seem to be very receptive to, keep note of that. So you don't incorporate that into your strategy if it's not working for them. Um, it's definitely helpful to look at people with a similar target audience to you to know how that audience interacts with them. And on that same note, it's helpful to see what people in your target audience are sharing, what types of content they're engaging with, so you know what to give them, what they want to share, what they want to see, and let that just really inform your strategy. So some important things on the organic side to look at would be, you know, what are your competitors' follower rates? What are their engagement rates? How many people are following them? And then what percentage of those people actually interact with their posts on a day-to-day -day basis? How frequently do they post? What 
platforms are they on? What times do they post? Do they have reviews? Are these reviews positive or negative? What types of imagery do they use? These are all questions you can ask when you're doing competitive research. And I'll pass it off to Emily to discuss specifically how to do competitive research on the paid space on social media. Yeah, thanks, Kayla. Um, so like Kayla mentioned, all of the um, research that you're doing on your competitors is going to help inform your strategy. To do that for ads specifically, you're going to go to facebook.com backslash ads backslash library. And then you'll be able to type in your competitor's business name and look up all of their current campaigns that they're running. Um, so you'll be able to see what platform they're running their campaigns on. Um, you'll be able to see if they're running campaigns around any social issues. Um, and you'll also be able to filter by active and inactive. So you can see a little bit of historical performance as well. Um, this is a great way to just track performance over time what your competitors are doing. You can you know, take some screenshots, keep them in a log. Um, and it's also a really great way to spark some ideas for your own team internally. This is uh, a perfect example of what the ads library looks like. So just pulled up a law firm, um, Lexington Law Firm. You can see here a little bit of details um, when their page was created, they have spent a little bit of budget on some social issue ads, which is um, pretty interesting to take note of. And then on the next slide is just a um, screenshot of some of the ads that they're running. So you can see the ad format. The first one is a still image and the second two are carousels, which are swipeable ad format that we'll talk about a little bit later. And you can also see the platforms that they're running only on Instagram and you can check out some of their copy as well. So just a really nice tool to go ahead and bookmark if you're interested in keeping up with your competitors um, on Facebook uh, in particular. All right, so back to the organic social media space. So I know when we hear the phrase organic, we think about food most of the time, organic carrots or celery or something. But when it comes to social media, organic content refers to the content that's going out directly on your social media platforms. And this is the content that is free to publish. So you don't need to put any ad budget behind it to make these run. It's just being shown on your page to anyone directly visiting it, as well as on the feeds of anybody following your social media accounts. So when you're building an organic social media strategy, the main things to consider are which platforms you want to be on, how frequently you should be posting, whether or not someone will be monitoring these accounts to engage with your followers, to answer comments and direct messages, and then of course, what types of what times of day your target audience is most likely to be online to make sure that you're posting when they're most likely to see it. Uh, some other things to consider when it comes to the types of content to post and how to appeal to this audience, seeing what they like to see. So do you want to post funny, lighthearted content that's easily shared, like memes and you know, funny little engaging things? Or do you want it to be more informative? Do you want to be a thought leader in this field with more long, for, long form articles, blog posts and infographics with as much information as possible? Or do you want to use social media as a forum to brag on your employees, to share client success stories and positive reviews and really put that face behind your brand? What you do is up to you, uh, but there are a couple of different ways to successfully use social media. There's no one right or wrong way. So here I have a couple of examples of those three strategies that I mentioned. So this first one on the far left right here is that more funny approach. It's easily shareable, it's engaging, it gets people interacting. However, it can come across in a more serious legal space as possibly offensive to some people. So this is an area to tread lightly. Uh, we do have to consider, you know, why do people use social media? They wanna be entertained, they wanna be informed. So this more humorous approach can work really well considering how people use social media. But if your brand voice tends to be more on the serious side, you can go with this middle approach. So this is actually a LinkedIn post. It's a little bit more informative. Uh, it links back to an article. So this is the type of content you can share if you want that more serious informative approach. And then on the far right here, we have the more personal approach. So that's you know, sharing holiday themed images from around uh, your office, featuring employees and just putting that face behind the brand. This is also really useful to be sharing you know, customer or client success stories. It's also a great forum for that as well. 
Uh, some other existing content ideas would be to do either a weekly or a monthly employee spotlight, to having a lot of infographics where you can make a lot of text into an image. Uh, that way it's more easily shareable across social platforms. Uh, of course, like I mentioned, sharing reviews for client success stories is a great way to build trust in your brand. And then most importantly, video content. Video is king on social media. Uh, pretty much across any single platform on social media, videos outperform still images. But people do have small attention spans. So you wanna make sure video content is usually between 10 to 30 seconds, that's it. So if you have a longer video, you can actually chop that up into a bunch of different posts and just make sure that it's mobile friendly and that it can still make sense with the sound off because I don't know about you, but I watch videos all day on social media without ever turning my sound on. Uh, so definitely make sure that the videos work with the way people use the platforms. And now I will pass it back off to Emily to discuss more of the paid social media marketing. All right, thanks Kayla. So to cover the paid portion, a lot of the questions that you ask for your organic strategy, you're also going to ask for your paid strategy. So you need to know what platforms are going to be most appropriate, who's going to monitor your ad engagement. Um, you don't want somebody to comment and have that comment sitting there without a response for days or weeks. Um, you need somebody who's going to be social on your social channels and engage with your audience. It's also important to know what goals you're hoping to achieve through your social media advertising and what budget you have to allocate to these ads. So just like with organic, consider how people use the platforms and um, make sure that your content matches. When it comes to advertising, there are three main objectives that you can use for social media advertising. The first one is going to be very high level awareness and brand recall. The second one is a little bit more um, for people who are already familiar with your brand um, and it's going to be driving people to your website and getting them to engage with your content. And then thirdly is a bottom funnel conversion campaign. So you want to make sure that all of your advertising efforts match whatever else you're doing, whether that's organic social, pay-per-click, SEO, email, if you have any radio spots or um, OTT spots. You just want to make sure that overall everything matches and people have a uh, seamless experience no matter what channel they're seeing your ads on. This is an example of a conversion funnel that we use here at Thrive. So just really quickly, you can see high level is that awareness and engagement um, type of objective. And then in the middle of the funnel, you can see we've got a traffic campaign, an app install campaign, um, Getting event responses is also a really great ad objective here. And then down at the bottom, finally, we're going for those on-site conversions or those lead generation form fills. There are a couple different audiences that you can target when you're advertising on social. So they fall into three main categories here. The first one is gonna be an interest-based target. And this is people who are interested in particular um, fields or they fall into a certain demographic interests. So um, if you are working with families, maybe you, know, you, you wanna target people who have children um, ages zero to 26 is the age range there. Um, maybe you want to target people who work in a specific, specific sector um, or a specific industry. You can target that through interest-based audiences. And then there's custom audiences and lookalike audiences. Custom audiences come from your user data. So um, like current customers that you have, current clients, CRM lists and email lists work really well for these types of audiences. And then lookalike audiences build off of the first two. So you can create a lookalike of current clients or a lookalike of people who have engaged with your content. And what that does is uh, it essentially just analyzes your audience, finds what all those people have in common, and then goes out and finds more people that have those same interests or demographic um, information the same. Creative types, I'll touch on this really quickly. There are a lot of different creative types that you can use in your advertisements. So go ahead and experiment and see which one works best for you and your audience. Um, an image is probably what you're gonna think of first, and that's just a still image, one piece of creative that shows underneath your ad copy. But there are carousel um, ad formats, which are swipeable, so you can include multiple different um, images in one ad creative. 
There's also video and like Kayla mentioned, um, go ahead and optimize that to be shown with sound off. There's slideshows, um, which are videos created from still images. So if you don't have a lot of video content, but you do have a lot of imagery, that can be a great way to get into the video space and see if people interact with that type of content. And then last but not least, there's a collection format, which opens up into a whole mobile screen experience. I would definitely suggest um, trying out images, videos, and carousels uh, before you deep dive into the collection, uh, the collection creative type, but it's a great way to experiment and see what your audience is gonna engage with. A lot of clients have questions about budget and bidding. What does my budget need to be? How much do I need to be spending on social media? Obviously that's going to be um, very specific to you and your business needs, but most companies spend approximately 10% of their revenue on marketing and of that about 30 to 40% is spent on digital. So this also goes back to your goals. Um, if you're going for a brand awareness objective and that is your entire goal for social media advertising, those uh, those actions, that awareness and that reach and those engagement actions come at a much cheaper cost than a conversion. So keep in mind your higher level objectives are going to come in at a lower cost while your lower funnel objectives are going to be more expensive. And then when it comes to bidding options, usually going ahead and keeping it at the default of a lowest cost bid is going to be great. Um, but if you ever wanted to play around with uh, what your caps are, your cost cap or your bid cap, you can definitely do that. Um, a cost cap is going to just keep the bid for your ad placement at a certain average cost. And then your bid cap, you're not going to pay any more than whatever you set your bid at. So you could potentially miss out on some audiences, but you could also, um, you know, if you have a really, really keen understanding of who your audience is, you can use those last two methods to really hone in and um, hit the people who are gonna convert at a certain price point for you. KPIs, these are always, always uh, very important. They go along hand in hand with your goals. So um, go ahead and set your goals and then establish your KPIs. So I've provided some here that fall into those three, um, those three objective types. And you can see that um, obviously the highest conversion uh, funnel level has much more high level KPIs. So like I said, reach impressions, your engagement rate, your recall lift, and then moving down, you wanna start measuring uh, landing page visits if you're going for a traffic objective, your click-through rate, your cost per click. Um, and then finally with conversion campaigns, it's all about measuring the cost of your conversion actions. So how many leads are you getting? How many contact actions are you getting? Um, what's the cost of those? And what's your return on ad spend for converted leads? I went ahead and provided some industry benchmarks here just so that you can take a look uh, at, you know, what is going to perform best for uh, legal industry professionals on Facebook and LinkedIn. Those are probably gonna be the most applicable platforms for your advertising efforts. Um, so go ahead and take a look at these metrics, jot them down. If you would like a recap of this, um, if you don't catch everything, we'll certainly be able to help you after the presentation. And then finally with your ad campaigns, it's all about measuring success. So sometimes, especially in a more um, corporate type of atmosphere, there can be some hesitation when it comes to social advertising because you're not sure how to provide uh, a measure of success. So part of that is just getting started. You have to establish a baseline before you can prove that anything is working. Um, so go ahead and establish your goals, establish your KPIs, and then run a couple test campaigns and establish a baseline. And then go ahead and um, continue measuring your performance, track your metrics over time, and optimize for what's performing best based on your goals and the data that you see coming in. Another thing that's important when you're measuring your success is to always A-B test all sorts of different um, creative types, messaging, any sort of audience that you wanna um, test against another well-performing audience. Social media is really all about uh, setting your campaigns, setting your goals, 
testing, tweaking, and then rinse, repeat. Um, so once you find what works after you've been A-B testing different creative types, different copy, you can go ahead and scale your most successful campaigns by increasing that type of content throughout your other advertising campaigns. Um, you can also increase your budget in 10 to 15% intervals. You wanna be careful here. Um, one trick of the trade that some people aren't aware of is that um, anytime you wanna scale your budget, if you do so too quickly, um, it can throw your campaigns back into what's called learning mode, and then they'll have to re-optimize to deliver. So go ahead and do that in 10 to 15% um, intervals of your current budget, and you should be fine. It's also really nice to find a reporting tool or a dashboard that everyone on your team can utilize to track performance. Um, you can go ahead and do that right within Ads Manager um, of Facebook and LinkedIn. You can track your performance there, but there are other tools that you can use. And that's a great way to prove to stakeholders that uh, your advertising efforts are uh, being successful in the social advertising space. And then it's important to also track your performance over time. But if you have any seasonal or time specific campaigns, uh, make sure you track that from start to, to finish. And then you can always compare year over year as you move forward. So just to recap, it's important to have a presence on the platforms that are most relevant to your audience. It's crucial that you find your niche and you check out your competitors and establish your brand guidelines and then determine your goals, A-B test your content, um, set up appropriate campaigns and budgets, and then monitor, report, adjust, and repeat. If you have any questions, you can always reach us at thriveagency.com or you can call us with the phone number below. And it has been a pleasure to um, work with you guys today and we hope you got a lot out of our presentation. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask.